Well, the challenge today is to deal with people we don't want to deal with, right? Well, we all have somebody, don't we? Oh, I mean, seriously, come on. Raise the hands. How many work with somebody that you don't necessarily care for? I think the challenge for all of us is I think there's a lot of pressures in the workplace. You know, and I think a lot of these pressures tend to affect people in different ways. And oftentimes, it's not the person and the difference in the person. It's the environment that sometimes causes the lack of communications. But there is different types of people. And I think that's something we all have to come to accept. Sometimes different people tend to have stronger relationships when they get to understand the differences in each other and the way they approach the same subject from different vantage points. But today, typically, I would say it's not dealing with difficult people. It's dealing with different people. That the difference in people sometimes accentuates the difficulty. And so you take a high-pressure environment and diversity and the uniquenesses in people, and it becomes difficult. So my challenge to us is don't relate to the person as difficult, relate to the person as different than you. And in the understanding of being different, we tend to develop some unique profiles. And that's part of the challenge of today's session. And certainly, I will focus on the challenge that if we profile people, and this has been done professionally, we need to look at at least four distinct uniquenesses. We certainly have the person who I refer to in your materials as the driver direct. You know, they, they, they seem to know where they're going. They'll tell you exactly how they feel about you. They'll be real abrupt when they do it, you know. Um, they want your agreement up front without any hassles, you know, and they're headed to a destination, and whether they know what it is or not, they're going to pretend they know. They tend to be very me-oriented typically. So if they're going to talk about something in relationship to something that's going on, they tend to use the personal pronoun I. And it tends to be very tough on a team. The whole concept is if I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this rather than we're doing this and we're doing this, teams don't develop as easily. They like people who are direct with them. So if I'm going to work with a person and I'm not in necessarily a person who seeks directness and focus on myself, if I'm dealing with a direct person, I will tend to be more direct. So in other words, I will tend not to walk around an issue. I will tend to point at the issue. So if I have a meeting with them, I'm not going to spend 15 minutes socializing. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to spend one minute socializing and 14 minutes focusing on exactly what it is we're here to talk about. If I have to do a report, and I do the report, I'm going to give them a five-fact cover sheet to save them time because they equate the number of pages not with the success of the job, but how easy it is to figure out what this is all about. You see what I'm saying? So I give them five points on top of it. I mean, I get the same thing when I fax people. You know, you fax them 15 pages, and a direct driver type won't read that stuff. I mean, they throw it away. You fax them one page with five points on it, you tend to get their attention. When I work with a direct person, I tell them I don't have a lot of time. I relate to it that way. Okay? But it's always important to make a direct person feel important, too, though, because they need that as part of their mission statement in life. The influence, on the other hand, is totally different person. You all work with these people. They're wonderful people. They tend to be socializers. They tend to be late for everything they go to. Okay? If you looked at their car, you would find out their car is late. A uh, driver direct person typically will have a car with nothing in it, right? And they won't keep a lot of things they don't need. They are not collectors. An influencer, on the other hand, if they are not, the old story, a closet full of junk, they don't think life's full enough. You love them, right? They never have a critical word, you know? And if they don't like what you're doing, they won't tell you, which is part of the challenge of dealing with this type of person. They will tell you, surely they agree to you and then maybe disagree with you in their own mind so you do not have consensus. The challenge for them is they equate what happens with relationship. And so when you relate to them and you're not that type of person, you need to, to, to be part of a relationship to relate to them. So when you tell them, if I'm a direct person and I'm dealing with a person who tends to be the influencer social type, I've got to casually talk about the importance of the relationship and why it means so much for us to be working together. You see where that comes from? Because that builds a basis for them. And we direct people can do this. I mean, we have to make a cognitive decision, though. And that's important for all of us. To deal with a different person requires a decision. It requires a commitment to do this. 
It requires your commitment to not only understand them a little bit better, but to kind of tune into their challenge uh, uh, and channel to be able to do this. The next one is called steady. Steadies are wonderful people. As long as things aren't changing, they're happy. Move their wastebasket from one part of their desk to another part of the desk, you will have a pile of paper on the floor where it was because they are repetitive by nature people. As long as things are where they are and run the way they run and stack the way they need to be stacked, they are the most productive profile we will run into. But you change a model number, you change a time of day, and these people are frazzled. Consistency for them is critical to their profile. So if you run into them in the hallway and say, hey, you, need a gr you did a great job on that project we had last week, and you don't tell them what that project was, you see what I'm saying? You negatively affect the relationship. Because it's not good enough for them to say, you did a great job. They want to know what was the process around the great job I did. Now, truly, that's important for all of us, though. I say never pay a compliment without telling the people why the compliments do. So if you pat somebody on the back and say, hey, it's great working with you, you know, tell them why you think it's great working with you. Do you understand? It creates better relationships among different people. And finally is the calculator. I know that one very well because that's the one I married. The calculator always has to put a number on everything. No, no, I've got to be careful about this, but if you give them a printed report, they will find the mistakes in that report before they look at the value of the report. They will say, do you know I read that, that report you turned in the other day? And there were 15 misspellings in that report. Well, what did you think of the report? Well, wasn't any good. 15 misspellings. Now, it might have been the finest research document you've ever done in your life. You might have researched this for months. You poured hours into that. It is critical information. But they judge it based upon what? The mistakes. How do you adjust to this type of person? Well, you got to make sure that everything is numerically bound and relates to a formula that makes sense. So when they say to you, how often do I need to do this? You better have an answer or they can't relate to that. Okay? When do you need this done? 8.01 on Friday. They can relate to that. And for goodness sakes, you know what they'll do? They'll get it done by 8.01 on Friday. But they go to that function. So when you challenge them around something that's important to them, you have to be very careful with this person because, you see, they are perfectionistic by instinct. They want everything to be perfect. Now, it must have been once when they were a kid, you know, and unfortunately it wasn't right, and they've lived this down. So you have to understand that. So my challenge for you in dealing with different people is, which one are you? You know, if you said, I'm not one of anyone, can I say that again? In other words, I don't want to say you're only a driver or you're only an influencer because I think people are a combination. But if we said, what was that primary communicative profile that you operate from in your business relationships, mine would be direct. So if I know I'm direct, then what a driver type, what I need to do is I need to modify, right? To deal with different types of people. So when I run into the socializer type, I know it's going to take more time. So if I'm going to put it in my schedule, what do I have to do? Yeah, because I want this business relationship to work, right? So I'm going to know it's going to be a little more time. I know that eight or nine minutes of the front end of it are going to be absolutely talking about social interaction and things that are important from a feeling standpoint, right? And I make that commitment. Why? Because I want our team to work. Is that right? That's right. And I know that if I had 15 people like me on our team, I wouldn't like it either, right? Because any number of any profile on any team tends to create an imbalance in terms of the relationships. So let's go through a few of the rules. Rule number one is we have to be absolutely sure in relationships today we balance emotion with reason. Okay? Balance emotion with reason. And what does that say? Look, I've got to look at the facts around the different types of people. I just can't take, let my feelings get in the way. So if you were walking down the hallway with me and I said, you know, you know, there's something you need to get around to and I need it by Friday and please go do this, right? Okay, and you walk off and say, I got no idea what Winninger was talking about. Now, feelings are going to get hurt in the end over this. Why? Because there was no benchmarked accountability in that. We have to work on this. So the responsibility is on both hands. The influencer social type is going to have to call me on the phone or walk into the office or catch me somewhere and say, wait a minute, Tom, you know, I've got to share this with you. Your directions come very fast. And I've got to accept that because of the difference and not let my emotions get in the way. 
I said, then in other words, what you're telling me, you'd like to take a little more time to talk about this before you leap on top of it so that we both end up with a successful negotiation here. Now, not to change the terminology, but that's exactly what the person wants. Now, I've got to be willing to do that, or I'm not going to be a member of the team. Those are the rules. Number two, seek mutual understanding with other people. Get to know people in terms of where their work style is coming from so that you can capitalize on that, not change it. It's great to have an influencer socializer on a team, isn't it? Oh, for goodness sakes, can you imagine if the whole team was direct, driven? You know, be tough. Number three, build good communication. And that takes time. It takes time to build communication because communications have to be a two-way street. So again, to bring it back to myself, when I talk to somebody and say, hey, I need you to do this, and I say, yeah, you do understand, don't you? Now, what's the other person going to say to me? Because I'm a direct, dominant person. Sure. That is not communication. That is not communication. Communication would say that there's a responsibility for that other person, irrespective of me, to say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm an influencer type. You're a director type. Winninger, I'm not getting it. Okay? I need a little more time on this. Okay? Can we take eight minutes, sit down, let me get a piece of paper and a pencil, and write this thing out? And then I would say, yes, but I can't do it till 4 o'clock this afternoon. And you say, that's fine. Okay, but if we're going to do it at 4 o'clock and we're going to sit down, then I want 15 minutes. Okay, okay, because we're going to socialize for five. <laughs> right? Now, I accept that because that's part of what we're talking about here. Number four, use persuasion rather than coercion. Oftentimes, certain types of people will get to where they want to go by creating a victim relationship with other people. In other words, you know, I, I might do this. In other words, on Tuesday, I said in the hallway something I needed to have done. On Friday, it's not done. I might very well, unfortunately, make the mistake of going to an influence or a study type and saying, look, that's a pure example of why you and I have trouble here. Now, what am I doing? I'm victimizing that person. Is that not true? Sure. When, in fact, if I really was smart about the differences in us, I would have appreciated the fact that this person need a little more time, need to socialize for five to six minutes before we talk about this, right? I should be victimized. Because I should have realized, you know, in that hallway that this is not getting across. But, but the whole idea is we've got to take the time and, and work with persuasion. And persuasion says that you create a relationship, you communicate effectively, you share the importance of what you're talking about, you get agreement to it, you verify it. That's persuasion. Coercion is nothing more than letting the person know that this is a pure example of what typically happens around here because it doesn't work. Number five is recognize your profile. Hopefully I've done a little bit of that for you so you know better how to relate to me. What profile do you fit? What profile do you fit? And number six is we all need to learn mutual acceptance. We all need to learn mutual acceptance. And I think it goes back to a simple principle, and that says we all came from different experiences. You know, we can try to model the fact we both came from the same city and we both came from parents, you know, and we both lived in houses maybe, whether we did or not, and say, good, we have a lot in common. But technically we don't. Because I would verify no matter where we're born and how we're raised, we have different relativity to different things that happen in our lives. And until we begin understanding that, we do not have a mutual relationship. But we all claim that we do. Oh, no, I'm from here, you're from there. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we agree on things or we work at things the same way? I don't think so. Today's teams will critically depend upon our ability to deal with different people more than ever before and to follow the rules we talked about today. Thank you very much. Thank you.